Kia ora and welcome to No ME. No ME is the podcast video series where guest speakers talk about pressing issues surrounding myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome. Join researchers, clinicians and patient advocates as we take a deep dive into the most recent evidence-based information so that you too can know ME. In today's episode, we will discuss post-exertional malaise, which is the cardinal characteristic of ME-CFS and has been found in long COVID. We are joined by Dr. Lynette Hodges and Jem Miffin. Dr. Lynette Hodges is a senior lecturer in sport and exercise at Massey University. She is a current board member of Clinical Exercise Physiology New Zealand and chair of the organization's Research, Education and Professional Affairs Committee. Over the past eight years, Dr. Hodges has undertaken research into post-exertional malaise in people with myalgic encephalomyelitis chronic fatigue syndrome. Jen Meffin is a cardiorespiratory physiotherapist. Through the pandemic, she was the chairperson of the Physiotherapy New Zealand Cardiorespiratory Special Interest Group. As a team, they were successful in advocating for appropriate access to PPE for physiotherapists. Jen is a member of the expert advisory group for the Ministry of Health Long COVID Guidelines. Jen works clinically at a private hospital and has set up a respiratory outpatient clinic for breathing pattern disorders and long COVID. Kia ora and welcome. Hare mai. Thank you both for being here today. Lynette, let us start with an explanation of what post-exertional malaise is. So post-exertional malaise may refer to any symptom that occurs after any sort of exertion. Whilst this is quite broad, it's essentially the inability to recover normally following physical, cognitive or emotional exertion. In the field of exercise, in my field, if a healthy person completes any exercise, they may suffer from delayed onset muscle soreness, which will recover within two to three days at a max. Most of the time, they'll be recovered within a day. However, those with chronic fatigue syndrome may take a lot longer and may suffer from other symptoms such as poor fatigue, uh, poor concentration, difficulty in thinking, flu-like symptoms, headaches, and maybe tender lymph nodes. So these are the symptoms that we consider post-exertional malaise. Great, thank you. Uh, Jen, in your role as a physiotherapist and in particular in cardiorespiratory, are you seeing a lot of patients with post-COVID conditions and uh, how are they presenting in clinic? Yes, absolutely. So I am I am getting people to my long COVID clinic and there are while there's no national funding for long COVID services, there are pockets of clinics across the country who are providing support. And so I'm speaking on behalf of what I see as well as what my colleagues are seeing in the public sector. And so most of the people we're seeing are people like us who prior to COVID-19 were happy and really competent in their jobs. They're working age, um, usually very active, and now they're just unable to do normal things like they could do normally. So, for example, they will go to work and they'll push through to get to work. But the key is when they get home, they're just exhausted. They need a nap at 5 to 6 p.m. They'll have their nap, have some dinner, go straight back to bed to start the day all over again. So some people are not able to go to work at all. Some people are not able to leave their homes and some aren't even able to leave their beds. And we're finding that, um, as Lynette's already said, the symptoms are out of proportion to the level of activity um, and it can be incredibly limiting. The symptoms can vary from person to person. And we're finding that people are coming through and often talking about muscle and joint pain or digestive issues or sensitivities to light, food, um, noise, for example. And it's really compounded by workplace not being supportive, by friends and family not believing how, how limiting this can be or not being believed by healthcare professionals. Um, so PEM is the main symptom that we're seeing. It's kind of extreme fatigue and other exacerbation of symptoms. Other things we're seeing that actually need to be ruled out, so they are worth mentioning, are cardiology symptoms, so palpitations, racing heart rate, even at rest, and orthostatic intolerance. So people noticing that when they stand up, they feel incredibly dizzy or lightheaded or unwell. And um, so the GP needs to follow up those symptoms and rule out other causes for those. And another symptom that needs following up is shortness of breath. And we're finding that people come to our clinic and they are so short of breath 
first of all, that's incredibly frightening. Second of all, they can't walk up a hill, which they may have walked up the hill to get their car after work before COVID, and now they're not able to do that. So we really need these people to be um, appropriately investigated by the family doctor to rule out alternative diagnosis. But we also need to consider the role of physiotherapy here in looking at breathing pattern disorder. From that viewpoint, we can make a lot of changes that can be helpful for individuals. Great, thank you. I mean, and there are so many symptoms that can come about as a result of PEM. And then it's frightening for people, especially our cohort of long COVID patients who it's so new to them. You find in the, in the research for ME that they're a bit more used to PEM now and, and managing symptoms. So, but we know now from recent biomedical research that the energy production system in people with ME is dysfunctional or broken. Um, for many years, graded exercise therapy was prescribed as the treatment. Uh, Lynette, can you tell us from your research what happens to someone with ME when they attempt graded exercise therapy? Yeah, sure. So I've got I've got experience both working with people with ME and also a little bit of experience working with long COVID nerves. I can give you a little input from both sides. So those individuals who have attempted graded exercise with ME, they are basically told that they're deconditioned, that they don't have the baseline exercise and they're not fit. Um, we know from long COVID that actually you don't get deconditioned by not training for five days. If you're an athlete and you're going for a competition, you actually go on a taper. That taper can be anywhere from one to 14 days. And, you know, from an athlete's point of view, they're at the peak of their condition and they're actually resting so that they're in a, their body's in a state so that they're the best that they can be on that particular day. Now, with long COVID, with ME, we're told that actually, you know, potentially the body's experienced a deconditioning phase and a deconditioning stage where actually the symptoms that people are expressing are from many different systems, affecting many different systems throughout the body. The cardiovascular systems affected, the neurological systems affected. Um, we've got signs of potentially inflammation and we've got signs of um, metabolic issues. So it's a number of different systems that are actually being affected. So it's all of those systems that need to be investigated and studied in combination to actually say, well, actually, it's not a case of deconditioning. Um, we can't just roll out a standard exercise program where, you know, everyone knows that they should be doing 150 minutes of cardiovascular exercise a day and two to three times of resistance training a week. It just simply doesn't work. The PACE trial um, way back in its heyday, um, they did a six minute walking test. The six minute walking test, I think, showed an increase of maybe 50 meters over a year. Um, usually with clients that I see with multiple sclerosis, um, they will actually increase their walking distance by 300 meters uh, and, and get a gr much greater percentage. So, you know, there's clearly been signs of dropout. There's clearly been signs of people not adhering to the exercise, although adherence rates haven't particularly been looked at within the, within the field of exercise therapy. And so, there's a lot more than this that meets the eye and that we need to be investigating. I've looked at exercise testing those people with ME CFS. And what we found is that there are some people who, um, when we think about maximum heart rate, some people can achieve their maximum heart rate, whilst other people can only attain 85% of their maximum heart rate. Recently, I um, tested a chap who was, had been off work with long COVID. And he came for a repeated exercise test because he wasn't sure where to go. The doctor had said to him he needed to do moderate exercise. Well, he now didn't know what moderate exercise looked like. So I sought me out and said, well, hey, can I come and do an exercise test? And maybe you can point me in the right direction of what this moderate exercise means. Hmm. So I gave him an exercise test. Um, he managed to achieve a power output of 210 he managed to meet his maximum heart rate at 170 on day one. He came back on day two, did another exercise test. He could only get to 195 watts. 
and he could only get to a heart rate of 156. All other parameters told me that he was he had a maximum exercise effort, um, but these kind of these issues with the heart rate not being able to get to maximum showed me that there was some cardiovascular um, deficits within within the system. Great, thank you. So, Jen, what ways may the graded exercise therapy actually cause harm rather than help if it's prescribed to people with ME and long COVID? Absolutely. So graded exercise, planned uh, exercise program where you increase over time how long you spend exercising and then you increase the intensity. And that's what when people think of exercise, it's ingrained in society, in society that when you do exercise, you start somewhere and then you gradually increase what you're doing to improve your fitness. But Lynette's talked about the dysfunction in the energy systems that we're seeing. So when people who have dysfunction and not dis not deconditioning, we're seeing, seeing the exacerbation of the symptoms. So the overwhelming fatigue, limited concentration. We hear a lot about brain fog, not being able to problem solve and difficulty at work and at the computer screen and an increase in pain. Some people are finding that their sleep is not refreshing. And unfortunately it's, there are, it's really hard to identify unless you know what you're looking for. So as health professionals, it's really important that we need to understand that people with, I'll talk about people with long COVID because that's where my experience sits predominantly, but they have variable baselines and it's unpredictable. We're finding that some days are great and then we're finding that other days are not great at all. And that's explained by what Lynette's explained in terms of the two day exercise testing. So get can cause harm and so what we need to be doing is looking at screening for PEM using some key tools and questioning appropriately and then making sure that any increase that we have in exercise programming sits within the individual's capability to be able to complete everyday tasks at home but without bringing on these um, symptoms. So it's actually a really finely tuned skill. There's no kind of one set answer and it really depends on the individual you're working with, making sure that you're not, when you're prescribing exercise, that first of all, we're not prescribing something that's going to trigger PEM. Absolutely. And it's about um, the avoidance of, of PEM, isn't it? Um, yeah so they don't get sicker and yeah being able to gradually recover and giving the body time to recover so I mean what does help then Jen um, is there a toolkit that physios and OTs and other allied health professionals can use absolutely so first of all we need to validate the lived experience um, and that's important active listening and making eye contact, your management plan and your decisions that you make together in your assessments will confirm that you've been listening. I always apologize if someone's let down by the system and um, that they felt ignored in the past. It's so easy to apologize and it's so powerful. So first of all, we need to make sure our assessments are safe. In terms of long COVID safety, we need to be assessing for cardiac impairment, oxygen desaturation on exertion, uh, screening for PEM or PESI, post accessional symptom exacerbation, and autonomic dysfunction. We need to assess for triggers and identify early symptoms. And we also need to be aware that long COVID has a cloaking effect. So an old injury can cloak long COVID or long COVID can cloak an old injury. For example, we're seeing a pattern with someone who might have had concussion in the past and now they've had COVID and their long COVID symptoms are very similar to what they've experienced with concussion. Um, promoting rest and recovery is a really good place to start with PEM. Get, saying to people, it's okay to go home and nap. It's okay to break up your day with um, pacing techniques and strategies um, in order to make sure that they haven't, they keep recharging their battery, for example. So we use the four pleas, plan, pace, prioritize and pleasure. And that can really help with getting to terms with how to plan out a day and a week and we use activity diaries in order to do that thinking about how we can change activities to change the way that we do them the timing and where they do it people who need to maintain a work output for example we need to think about if they were in a packing role in a, in a factory for example we think about a slower conveyor belt to be able to maintain work function but is there a way that you might use that analogy of a slower conveyor belt in the places where you work so just thinking differently about how to enable people to do the things that they need to do. 
Um, and we also need to consider that predominantly we're seeing mostly females. And I'm wondering whether this is reflective of the female population as essential workers, but also we need to consider those societal pressures that push other people to keep on going and keep pushing through to PEM, um, but not necessarily seeking support. Another way of uh, functioning and trying to work with PEM and avoiding PEM is using heart rate monitoring. And that is where we use really conservative heart rate ranges, for example, resting heart rate plus 15 beats per minute and using a reliable, really good wearable watch to be able to help somebody pace within the exercise, um, their heart rate response to activity. But there's recently been a really helpful um, paper out from the UK from Physios for ME, and they looked at people's perceptions using devices to guide activity and responses are a mixed bag. So you've got to take your positives with that technique with your negatives and putting in some really strong boundaries about what it's good for and where actually it might be unhelpful um, to be able to support people in using the strategy that works best for them as an individual. I have a question for you, Jen. Yeah, go. Um, you talked about uh, reliable wearable watch. Um, what sort of reliable wearable watches are you talking about? Are you talking about Fitbits or should we be airing on the more expensive Garmin's or Polar? Is there a particular watch? Yeah, that's a great question. So in terms of wearables, um, the watches are not perfect by any means, um, but they can be helpful as a tool. We're finding that um, Apple, Garmin and Polar other brands that are helpful. And the ideal would be to wear a chest strap and use this chest strap, which is an elasticated band with sensors on that sits kind of around the bra level for women. And they, I prefer those, but they're not gonna be very comfortable to wear all day, every day. So those are the devices we're finding to be more reliable um, than some of the more um, less expensive brands. Great, thank you. <clears throat> So people with ME have been pacing for a long time. So what else, Lynette, can those with post-COVID conditions learn from ME? So yeah, people people have been pacing for quite a long time with uh, ME CFS. And like Jen said, plan, pace, prioritise and pleasure is a really good place to start. Um, keeping a diary of tasks that you've completed and how this has has affected uh, your post exertion malaise symptoms is really important. Um, as an exercise physiologist, I know that different tasks can require different amounts of energy. So such as uh, sitting at a desk, washing dishes and walking slowly, that's only classified as three minutes. Um, but if we think about things such as mowing the lawn, and vacuuming, they're at a much higher energy cost to the body. So we have to think about um, if I wash the dishes, what is the cost going to be to me? And am I going to have to almost pay a, pay a debt in order to complete those tasks? And honestly, we can only understand that by people keeping a diary and then understanding and listening to our patients, validating their experiences, um, understanding what actually is bringing on their fatigue. Only by doing that, we can then understand, well, actually um, this task amounted to this much energy and maybe we should try a different task which doesn't require so much energy. So I, I think pacing, keeping a physical activity diary, um, maintaining a consistent level below our sort of energy envelope. People talk about the energy envelope. Um, it's important to kind of pace ourselves. And like Jen said before, it's okay to have a nap. You know, she's talked about women. Um, I'm a woman with four children. I know that actually I want to push through the day. Um, I want to be there for the kids. I need to make the dinner. I need to take them to activities. Actually, it's okay to say no and it's okay to need a rest, and it's okay for other people to come and help. Absolutely, that's useful advice, thank you. I think it's important to recognize that those in the early stages of long COVID can recover, 
So Jen, how can allied health professionals help with this rehabilitation process? So allied health, who are we? We're, the, we're part of the professions that aren't doctors and aren't nurses, and there's many, many, many allied um, health professionals. Um, in the context of long COVID, we can talk about physiotherapists, a clinical exercise physiologists, clinical psychologists, occupational therapists, dietitians, and our speech and language therapists. Um, we need to make sure that we're not gonna do any harm as a starting point for those professionals, but we also need to learn about the condition and we need to make sure that we're learning from the individual too. So having somebody to coordinate a person's um, management plan can be really helpful. And whether that sits with the uh, family doctor, whether that sits with a physiotherapist or another professional that is the main point of contact can vary. And so we just need to think outside um, our own professional boundaries. So are we working to the edge of our scope and are we competent? And then if we uh, get to the edge of our scope and actually do we need to think about our, our, our colleagues? So in terms of seeing somebody with long COVID, I can talk to people about um, using equipment to make their task easier, like sitting down to prepare, prepare meals. Um, but do we get to a point where actually an occupational therapist will be really helpful at this point to talk about um, pacing and strategies for managing energy that I'm not as good at talking about, or do we need to think about um, equipment provision? Clinical psychologists are going to be very key for lots of people. There are lots of people who are really struggling with the fact that they were active and now they're limited. And so it's, for me, I um, practice, I'm familiar with acceptance and commitment therapy. That's where I've had my training. And so I can use strategies, but there comes a point where actually it's out of my scope of practice and I need to refer somebody on for more clinical psycho psychology support. Um, dietitians are helpful in the long COVID space because I'm noticing a pattern with my patients that alcohol and high carbohydrates are exacerbating symptoms. But again, I don't have a lot of training in dietetics, so we need to rely on our dietitians um, to provide that advice. And um, my area of expertise is uh, breathing pattern disorder, but there comes a point with the voice where I know that our speech and language therapists will be better placed to support our patients. So it's about being able to work to your scope and what you're able to do, and then recognizing that we each bring something different to the mix and knowing who to refer on to and who to get that support from is really important. Collaboration, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And the, actually the key, key profession, which I think um, I need to mention for sure is social work because the systems are complex to navigate for financial support and um, accessing of services. And once you even figure out where to go for that support, the forms to complete and the system to get through to get that support is really complicated. So our social workers are going to be really great in that space. Absolutely. And also because people with long COVID and ME have such cognitive impairment, the brain fog, the difficulty problem solving, just thinking straight, um, you know, and when you're exhausted, just trying to fill out a form is like running a marathon. <laughs> it really is. Yeah, absolutely. So... Um, just obviously, ANSMES has a petition in Parliament at the moment, and we recommended that the health system incorporates a wraparound service. So it's sort of sort of on the same vein as what you're talking about, where we actually have a team approach for one individual. You know, where we do uh, bring in all the different allied health professionals that are required. Um, do you think that there is an interest from the professional community, Jen, um, to collaborate in providing these kind of comprehensive services to people with chronic and disabling conditions? Yeah, I think that New Zealand health reforms are actually a key opportunity for health, the health community to unite and to advocate for our own patient groups. Um, we have a when we're trying to move from a system with chronic staff shortages, overwhelming workloads, um, prov health provision inequity, and that system is failing to meet the, no the, the needs of the people who need to use the service. So from the allied health perspective, we actually, we're really skilled and knowledgeable on how to provide services to people with lived experience, and we're really a cost-effective option. 
In terms of the community groups, uh, like ME support and chronic complex illness support groups, they're already providing that service in a really cost effective way because they're having to rely on fundraising to be able to provide that service. So what I would like to see, <laughs> and it's honestly, I, I know it's blue sky thinking, it's up there, but I actually think we need to turn the system completely on its head. We need to allow allied health professionals to work together and to their full scope, meaning that people could come directly to see a physio um, or an occupational therapist or a clinical exercise uh, physiologist and bypass the GP system. And we would be skilled enough to know that actually this person needs more investigations. Go to your GP for X, Y and Z. And uh, that would take the pressure off, a family, off of the family doctors, off the emergency department, off the after hours service. And that's for the people that can afford to use those services. But we need systemic change. Um, we need to be able to support people to live their best. Um, exercise and eating well are two examples of modifying risk factors for many long term conditions. Um, and that's far more cost effective than just medical management alone. So we need to be prioritizing and enabling people to be well first and foremost um and I just honestly I think we just need to think differently we need to um people who do the job well to be enabled to do the job well to be the first port of call we've already set up the systems we've got long COVID clinics forming in places there's no funding um nationally so we just need to look at where these projects are already running ready to go services from community groups are already functioning and need more funding let's put the money there in order to get i think we'll get good um health dollar return for that um but it means that our, the people we work with are able to live at their best and for me that's really the joy of a job well done exactly and the, you know the most important thing is preventative medicine and it seems that we are our health system tends to treat and manage symptoms rather than getting to the root cause and I think personally that that needs to you know that needs to change and that this is the, the opportune time now isn't it with the health reform is to get it right and to get uh, everybody collaborating and talking to each other and seeing the body as a whole absolutely we the system's really designed to be the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff <clears throat> that's the analogy we use when we talk about this professionally and we really need to move to the point where we're not even letting people get close to the edge of the cliff mm, um, but we need we need funding and we need to communicate and one of the things we've demonstrated as um health professionals and community groups is that we're actually able to get together and unite and save on our energy and do things together as a group and um, so we've already started so let's let's get the funding and keep going Exactly. Dedicated government funding to provide, you know, consistent service and a national service. Um, yeah, we have all the regional groups doing it. So let's put them all together. Absolutely. <laughs> I totally agree. <laughs> so good. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> well, so Namahi, thank you both, Dr. Lynette Hodges and Jim Meffin, for being with us here today um, for this episode of No ME. It's been thoroughly interesting and descriptive discussion of the complexities of PEM and how pacing can help with long COVID recovery and ME symptom management. So thank you both for providing us with your wealth of knowledge and expertise. You've been listening to or watching an episode of No ME, a place for you to hear the most up-to-date evidence-based information on ME and post-COVID conditions. Thank you for joining us. Tune in next time for a deep dive into diagnostic criteria for ME and long COVID. Ka kite anō.